I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, and I have my good friend Jerry Branham with us this week, and we are going to talk about the brand new Arnold documentary that is out on Netflix. I'm sure everybody has seen it by now. It is a big three-part documentary that covers his whole life. Uh, the first part covers Arnold the Athlete, which was his bodybuilding career, of course, and then the second part was about the movies, Arnold the Actor, and then the third part was uh, Arnold the Politician. So I wanted to have you on the show, Jerry, and uh, talk about it. Uh, you had a chance to see it, and you thought it was really good, right? Yes, I did. I actually watched all three. I wouldn't call that binge watching it, uh, you know, because <laughs> I have like a personal stake. Because I, I'm, I actually knew Arnold. Right. I'm, you know, I, I trained with the guy when he was in, in his bodybuilding heyday. I knew the guy, and I, I was, you know, I wanted to see what kind of job they did. So I watched all three, one after another. Like it was over three hours. I yeah. watched the whole thing, and I got to say, right from the onset. It was a welcome uh, uh, relief after trying to watch his FUBAR movie. You know, that <laughs> made, I mean, because I, I got to tell you, let me say, I got to say, even if I don't, didn't know Arnold personally, I will tell you, I loved most of Arnold's movies, especially some of them stand out. The Terminator movies, most of them I loved. I thought they were fantastic. Yeah. I, I love the uh, Conan movies and a couple of, I, I can't think of one, even the ones that people didn't like, like The Last Action Hero. I yeah. still liked it, right? Yeah. But, so I watched this FUBAR be, uh, mainly because Arnold was in it, hoping that you'd have some of the classic Arnold. Instead, it really, other than Arnold himself, it was a horrible movie, horribly written, yeah. miscast, completely miscast. The, the dialogue was stupid. But because I like Arnold so much, I, I lasted four episodes. And then I, I was driving, by the fourth episode, I'm pulling my hair out. I, I said, this, I can't take it. This is like torture to me. And I turned it off and never watched it. So then when I saw that they putting on this documentary about Arnold's life, I said, now this, I, I, I had great anticipation. And quite frankly, I was not disappointed. It was yeah. very well done. Uh, and the thing I really, as I said on Facebook, the thing I really liked about it was Arnold was very candid. Yes, it, it, it's been criticized. It's, People have criticized Arnold because he left certain things out. Like he, like for example, some people say, "Why didn't he talk about the '80 Olympia?" You know, the <laughs> controversy of why. You know, you know, you you've interviewed a lot of people who were there, John. You know, yeah. about how he shouldn't have won. Well, why didn't he talk about the '81 Olympia where <laughs> Franco got the gift over Danny Padilla and right. and uh, Tom Platts? But but the thing is that that didn't really go with the context of the show. Yeah. I mean, what is he supposed to say? I mean, I mean, what could you think about it? Common sense. Uh, it, it, you know, if they, if these, let's say, off camera interviewer says, Arnold, uh, there's been some controversy about the 80 Olympia. A lot of people say that you were not at your best and you shouldn't won. What, you shouldn't have won. What is he supposed to say? Well, it, well, it's true. I shouldn't have won. I mean, come on. He's yeah. Like, I mean, you know. Plus, plus, it's only three hours. I mean, we can't go into every yeah, detail I mean, of life. You, you, know? you can't talk about every kind in the big In the big picture, the 80 Olympia wasn't a big part yeah. of Arnold's life. Right. No. Yeah, but but the thing I liked about it, which caught me off guard, uh, and this is true, was some of Arnold's comments I really didn't expect. Like you got to remember, John, there was a scene where he's training in his home gym, very well equipped home gym. He yeah. has at his house, and he's walking around. And he's and he says, he says, "Look at me, I look like shit." Right. <laughs> he says, he says, "I haven't had abs in years." Right. <laughs> like, Holy shit, Arnold said, "I've never yeah. heard Arnold talk like that, <laughs> never." You know what right. I mean? I mean that that's unusual for him. You know. Yeah. And, and there was some uh, very touching scenes. You know, I, I like the way he talked about his son Joseph. You yeah. know, the, the one that he had with the 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 maid. You know, I mean, I know Joseph. I met him a couple of times, and I could attest he's a great guy, very nice guy. I mean, he has no airs about him. He's just the really nicest guy you could possibly meet. And Arnold acknowledged him, said he was proud of him. I, I like that. I mean, he could have easily just mentioned his other kids and, and kept them out of the picture. You know? Yeah. And the other thing that really impressed me about that uh, uh, about that uh, uh, video or show or documentary 
was when he when he's talking about uh, Franco. That was very touching. Yeah, it was. Yeah, like, like the scene where he's riding on his bike. Yeah, and, and he stopped by that mural. Yeah, and he, and he touched the mural with us. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you could you could sense how much he misses Franco. Best and friend. Yeah, they, you know, because all that was true. They were very close friends. You know. Yeah. But but to be perfectly honest, as I said, I trained in the original Gold's Gym. I saw Arnold every day when I went there. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I sometimes him and Franco would do an exercise together, maybe bench presses or bent over rows. But most of the time I saw Franco train on his own and Arnold would train with other guys like Danny Gable. Uh, who else? Dave Draper, all these other guys. He Ken did not King. always train. Huh? Ken Keen. Yeah, Ken Keen. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, from what, my perspective, he, he rarely trained with. They trained at the same time. Yeah. But Frank would get Franco, like I said in a past interview with you, Franco has a was a less uh, stringent type of training system. Franco would basically go in and train whatever he wanted. He would do, he could do chest three days in a row. Mm -hmm. Arnold was more regimented. Arnold would do certain body parts on certain days, and then mm -hmm. before the contest, he'd start training twice a day, certain day, blah blah blah. You know, but you know, so it, it, that part where he, he led. If you watch the video, it makes you believe. That him and Franco, because you know, they showed the scenes of them working out at the you know, yeah. beach. You would think that they constantly trained together. That was not true. Yeah. Just, you know, and of course Arnold always makes those statements, which I just can't understand. Where he talks about training five hours a day. <laughs> I, I, I've never seen that. Right. Arnold trained. Awesome. Uh, the most I've ever seen him train is two hours. That's it. Yeah. Most of the time it was about an hour and a half. He'd do about two body parts. Uh, sometimes he would come back and do another workout in the afternoon. He trained in the morning, afternoon. Yeah. Uh, and in the off season, he had even shorter workouts. Like I said, he'd come in maybe three, four times a week, about a half hour. Yeah. So now he might have trained five hours. You remember in the scene where he's talking about, he shows him in the in the little old gym where he trained back in Austria. Yeah. How yeah. He mark each set with a chalk uh, on the uh, wood, and he and he says, "That's how I knew I did twenty sets." But B zips and tree zips and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's possible that he trained five hours back then. You know, I'm not saying he lied about that, but not at Gold's Gym. I never saw it happen. Never. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a, <clears throat> I thought it was really well done too. And I know they've been working on this for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, actually, the producer of the, one of the producers of the documentary contacted me a couple of years ago because he wanted, uh, he saw some of my podcasts and he wanted to get um, information of people he could interview, like Charles Gaines and oh. Boyer Co. I think Roy Callender, Mike Katz. Yeah. So uh, Boyer and uh, Charles were in the documentary a little bit. Yeah. And then he was telling me about, you know, so I knew about this thing for a couple of years, but I didn't know when it was coming out. And then uh, somebody told me that I was actually in the credits, like given a special thanks at the oh, end. Is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that was pretty cool. Wow. I'm surprised. I, I thought it was. I thought it was well, real well done. Especially what I liked most about it, from a bodybuilder's perspective, was all that raw footage of pumping iron that we never saw before. Yeah, yeah, that was great. That was amazing. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and and uh, I mean, it just again Arnold's candid remarks. Just, uh, I mean, the, the whole thing about his wife and and the kids and all that stuff. And yeah, and, you know, he's mentioned that before. This is nothing new. We talk about. You know, the, the horrible mistake, how he let his family down. And, you know, I always tell people, I've said this for years, Arnold is the single most successful self-made person I've ever met personally in my life by far. Yeah. Because the stories he tells people about coming over here in 1968 with oh, basically a suitcase and nothing, you know, is true. Yeah. Because when I met him in 68, which was a week after he lost to Zane in Florida, you know, at the 68 universe, you remember, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I told you the story how he showed me the die, and, you know, and mm -hmm. the all pissed off because he thought Zane was, a, you know, he was clearly superior to Zane, blah, blah. But the point is that he was driving a a, a rented a, a Volkswagen Beetle that Joe Weed had rented for him. And he, shared, and he was living in a small apartment about two blocks away from Vincent Jim. That's where I walked with him, where he told me the story about the Miami show. I yeah. mean, you know, the guy really did have nothing. Yeah. He had nothing. I mean, you got to give the guy credit. I mean, oh, yeah. He's done so well for himself. And, and, and I tell people, I think I might have told you, it's hard to believe, but on one of those 
you know, we used to walk down the street there and uh, when, after the workout at Vince's gym. And at one point he said to me, how uh, I remember the, he said to me, I'm going to win. He talked about the NAB universe. Remember, this is old 68. Yeah. He wasn't talking Olympia yet. He's, he'd already won, I think, two NABBY universes at that point. Correct, yeah. He said something. He says, I'm going to win uh, five more NABBY universe uh, contests. This is him. I think he was, what, 20, 21 years old when he told 21, me. 21, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm going to, uh, then he says, then he says, uh, he says, you know how when people talk about uh, uh, muscles uh, in the movies, they always mention muscles like Steve Reeves. Yeah. I said, yeah, Arnold, absolutely, you know. He says, one day, the expression will be muscles like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. <laughs> and that came, as you know, every Absolutely. Week, every yeah. Every time there's a reference to muscles, muscles like Arnold, it came to pass. Yeah, That's yeah. True. But the third thing's the real shocker. He said to me something about when, back in Austria, he was always interested in politics. And he, he didn't specifically say, but he says, at one point, I'm going to go into politics and I think I'll be just as successful in politics. Wow. I mean, this is at 21 years of age. Yeah. I mean, if I didn't hear it myself, I wouldn't believe it to tell you yeah. that. Yeah. And when he said this stuff to me, I'm not going to deny it, John. When he told me all these predictions, uh, you know, he was a nice guy. I liked him. I didn't want to contradict him. So I kept it to myself. But I'm thinking, boy, this guy is a dreamland. <laughs> He's going to be in the movies and he yeah. thinks he's going to be uh, some sort of a politician. Right. You know, Maybe maybe the NABBY universe is possible, you know? Yeah, yeah. But the other stuff I dismissed immediately. Yeah. So, you know, but when he actually was elected governor, I, I thought about that conversation. <laughs> and I said, son of a bitch, he was right again. He did it. <laughs> you know, there he is, you know, yeah. governor of California, you know? Well, I, I had a similar reaction because I got into bodybuilding in 77. So this was two years after he retired. Right. And he was still a muscle builder all the time. And they were, he was yeah. still the king, you know, basically, even though there was another Mr. Olympia. And uh, he was doing interviews all the time. So then when Pumping Iron came out that year, remember, he went around the country promoting it like crazy. Right. And I lived in Chicago and they had, an, they had an article about him in the Chicago Tribune. And the Chicago Tribune was one of those uh, newspapers that where you, it had, you folded it out. You know, it was a big, yeah. a big one, not a smaller one. It was like the big, you know, it was folded and then you un right. unfolded it and it was really big. They had a big, they had a big picture of him doing a double bicep, and wow. they had his, they had his measurements like fifty seven inch chest, twenty two inch arms. Yeah. So I read the article, and this is nineteen seventy seven, and he goes, uh, and they said, so what are you going to do now? And he's like, well, I'm going to make movies, you know, I'm going to make more movies because he was already in Pumping Iron, yeah. and he goes, but make no mistake, this is his, his quote. He goes, make no mistake, I'm not going to be just a regular actor like. Um, what did he say? Oh, or, I'm not going to be an athlete that goes into movies right. like like O.J. Simpson or someone like that. And he goes, I'm going to be a major movie star. Right. That was right. his quote. That, and that, that, then that, when that, it was then when it was happening in the 80s, I'm like, holy shit, he's doing it. He's, I was like, yeah, no, no, no. it could happen. You know, I'm like, yeah. every movie that came out like Conan and then Conan 2 was bigger yeah. and then Terminator was bigger. And then every movie was bigger. And I'm like, he's doing it. He's doing it. He's making it happen. <laughs> You know, the thing about Arnold, and I think they showed this in the documentary also, is when he first got into acting, he wasn't very good. I mean, let's no. face it, I mean, he was stiff. I mean, the, the, the Arnold is very embarrassed whenever that Hercules in New York yeah, film yeah. is brought up. And, you know, when you watch it now, it's kind of funny. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's almost like a campy movie because it's it's so, I mean, they called himself Arnold Strong and this right. and that. Well, they called him Arnold because he... They felt that people couldn't pronounce the word Schwarzenegger. Right. So they, and his co-star was Arnold. What was his name? Stang or something Dang, like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they figured Arnold Strong, Arnold, and, and yet Stang and Strong. They thought it would be, you know, would have yeah. a little, a little, a little, with a, a little, a little iteration of the of the words or something like that. But I mean, he was hilariously stiff in that movie. Yeah. I mean, you, you know the story is that Joe Weider. You know the story about how Joe Weider supposedly got on the role. They were looking for a uh, actor and. Uh, and uh, to play Hercules, and Joe Weed is like, just I got I got the guy for you. I got just the guy for you. His name is Arnold Schwarzenegger. He actually uh, did Shakespeare in Austria, you know. <laughs> and of course, you know these movie producers, they don't know crap about anything when it comes to right. bodies. So they hired him. I mean, I'm sure that after the first couple of scenes were shot, they're they're, they're looking, thinking, wait, this guy did Shakespeare? What do you <laughs> do? Come on, man. Right, you know? right. 
but the, they, had, they had it, you know, they they had to dub his uh his voice. His voice. But, yeah. You know, but but my point is with each you know succeeding movie, I, I gotta give Arnold credit for this too. He got a little bit better as an actor. Yeah. I, there's a couple of movies where he's an actually a pretty damn good actor, if I say so. My you know, uh I, offhand I, I, I for example, there was one where he played can't remember the name of it, John. Where he played the father of a of a girl who was a zombie. I don't remember that. Oh and yeah, he, yeah, that was later on. Yeah, like I mean, it did, older. It, yeah, it, it didn't do that well at the box office. I did see that though. Yeah, right. But if you watch the movie, Arnold does a very good acting job. He really yeah. does. He, yeah, he's like a legitimately good actor in that movie. Yeah, and most of his. I'm not going to say that Arnold is up there with you know Lawrence Olivia and Marlon Brando. No, no. You know, but I mean, he's certainly passable as a decent actor, which is again a testament to Arnold. Mm -hmm. Arnold, you know, he took the acting lessons, he took the speech lessons. Yeah. When he when he, when he trained for Conan, he had these guys show him how to do the sword. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Arnold is a stickler for doing things right and trying to improve himself, and that's one of the keys to success. Yeah. He always tried to, you know, he he always tried to do the best he could. And improve himself, and, and and always set goals. The most goal oriented guy I've ever seen. Yeah. And like I told you in past interviews, this is a guy who would never take a, a no for an answer. If yeah. You said to him, Arnold, you can't do this, you can't do that. I myself told him not to try to be an actor because mm -hmm. of his accent and his size. I said, Arnold, you're just going to be playing leg breakers in the background, or guys who beat other guys up. I right. Said, he says, well, I'm going to give it a shot anyway, you know. But you see, <laughs> but you see, as Arnold said in the movie, I think I don't know whether he said it to somebody else. But, uh, you know, this was said in the um, in the documentary when Arnold went into the movies, and you know this is true, John. He was already a multimillionaire from real estate. Yeah, this is a guy who had nothing to lose. Yeah, he wanted to be an actor; that was his thing. But if he didn't, so what? He was he a rich guy. Said. It yeah. makes no difference. He's not going to be on the sidewalk because he can't get a role. Yeah. You know, now you contrast that with a lot of actors, including bodybuilding friends of mine who I've seen over the years out here. They put all their eggs in one basket. They have no other assets. They have no no other uh, uh, sources of income. You know, they're working menial jobs, hoping to get the big break in acting. And very sadly, and I'm not making fun of them, 99.9% .9 of them never make it. Right. I've seen I've seen guys for years, uh, I'm talking 30, 40 years, try to break into show business. They never make it. There are lucky guys. Arnold, I, I don't like to use the word lucky because you could say, well, he was in the right place at the right time, but he took advantage of the opportunity. You know what I'm saying? In other words, he, his success was built on one thing after another. Like he got panned for that Western movie he did with Kirk Douglas. The villain. Was, the villain. I mean, they also panned him. They said he was stiff and this and that. But you see, that led to him uh, meeting this other guy, uh, this director, who put him in Stay Hungry. Now, Stay Hungry, he got a Golden Glove as the best newcomer of the year. Yeah. And that, and he, and that built on to more roles. Yeah. Know, than the rest of them. See what I'm saying? So, yeah, you know, it was a question of, yes, there was some luck involved, but there was also a fact that Arnold took advantage of every opportunity and he went for it. He yeah. went you know what I mean? Yeah. Lou Ferrigno, he's another guy who got lucky. They needed, a, uh, I mean, uh, I remember when I heard about the casting of the Hulk, you know, I don't know if I, my, I, I don't know whether I told you this. I was told they called the gym, you know, the producers of the Hulk show. And they, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this job. They wanted him, <laughs> you know, because the Hulk is a massive big guy, right? Yeah. They, they said they were looking for a bodybuilder who was at least seven feet tall. <laughs> like a professional bodybuilder physique. Yeah, yeah. And I and I, you know, I spoke to one of these guys. I said, there's no such animal. There's one guy, the tallest bodybuilder I know of is a guy named Ralph Mueller from uh who happens to be one of Arnold's close friends. They yeah. still work out together at Gold Gym even today. I believe he's six foot seven. Yeah, yes. Yeah. He was the tallest, but uh, the other uh, the only other one was Lou Ferrigno. Yeah. Six and he was a legitimate multi Miss Universe winner, Mr. Olympia contender, and he was six foot five. So, you know, he, he again, right place, right time. He got the role. And, you know, Louis is still making movies for Crane Outlaw. I just saw, he's making, I just saw pictures. He's playing some sort of hermit. He has this big black. Oh, really? Yeah. 
That's a, probably be. He was out. in. Um, did you see the movie? The or is a miniseries called The Offer? It was about the I making did. of the Godfather. I did. Yeah, he was I in did. that. He played Luca Brasi. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing is, I mean, Lou, he hardly had any line. He had, what, one line in the whole? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he looked like a big, rough guy. Yeah. You know, and, uh, but, you know, because Louis, you know, he's an Italian guy. He, he, can, has a, he has that kind of face where he could look like a mean guy, even though he's not. Yeah, and but he's he still was, big. Yeah, he was good for the role. But, you know, I, I expected a little bit more lines from him. Right, right, yeah. I think he said, he's here. That was his line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't have to worry about memorizing dialogue. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah well, I think what, what happened with Arnold was um, he wanted to get into the movies all the way in the 70s. And yeah. he was in a movie called, after that, Hercules in New York, which was made in like 69, I believe. That's right. Then he was in a movie called The Long Goodbye with um, ah, Ellie yeah. Poole, who played Philip Marlowe. And he right. was, like you said, he was the leg breaker guy. He was the guy in the background, no yeah. lines. You know, he just, they took his shirt off at one point, right. you know. Yeah. Yeah, but you know that's the movie I had lunch with Arnold right when that movie came out. Oh, movie. really? Yeah, I had seen Arnold in that. You know, standing in the background. That's what made me say that to Arnold. Oh, okay. I yeah. said, Arnold, that's the kind of parts they're going to give you. You're going to be these guys who beat up other guys standing in the background. I said, you know, you they, they you're too big, and the accent. It's it's you know just yeah. no role. And he, you know, like like I said, it went one ear out the other, you know. Well, like like you said too, he had money, so he, I remember him saying in interviews, he goes, "I didn't have to take any role that came away. I didn't have to right. play the truck driver or the bouncer or the bad yeah. guy or whatever. I didn't have to take those roles, you know." Yeah. And then he did. He kind of did get lucky because one of the things I I wish they would have covered a little bit more in the documentary was the influence of Pumping Iron and Charles Gaines. I mean, they did inter interview Charles Gaines. But they didn't interview him that much. And I don't think they, they kind of went over how big that was in Arnold's career. Because yeah. first, the, the book came out, Pumping Iron, which right. was a mega hit. Yeah. So that came out in um, 74. Right. And then uh, this was when Arnold was going to quit. He was going to quit bodybuilding after 74. He wasn't going to compete in 75. Right. And then Charles Gaines' first book, which was a fiction book, was Stay Hungry, yeah. which came out, I believe, in 72. And for some reason, Hollywood liked that book. It was kind of a, a weird, uh, offbeat book. Yeah. But it, it, he won a book award for it. It was his first book he ever wrote, and he won a book club award for it. And then Hollywood grabbed it, and they bought it. And this guy, this director, Bob Rafelson, wanted to direct it. So Bob right. Rafelson had directed Five Easy Pieces with uh, Jack Nicholson. Right. And Charles Gaines told him, he goes, well, for this role of Joe Santo in the book, the bodybuilder, he goes, you got to get a bodybuilder. You can't just get an actor who will lift weights. You got to get a real bodybuilder. Yeah. So what Charles told me was uh, uh, Bob Rafelson didn't want to hire him. He goes, he, he doesn't have any acting experience. He goes, I'm not going to hire him. He's going to yeah. be up against Sally Field and Jeff Bridges. He goes, I'm not going to hire a, an unprofessional actor, someone who's never acted before. Yeah. So then he met he met Arnold and Arnold charmed him, as he always does, you know. And then I guess the only way he agreed to it was he's got to go to an acting coach. So he gave him Jack Nicholson's acting coach. Oh, who was yeah. this guy named Eric. Um, what's his name? He actually was interviewed in the uh, documentary. He's older. Yeah, now. I saw him. Yeah, I saw him. Yeah. yeah. So then he took, I think, eight weeks of acting lessons. And I think in the beginning, Arnold really did want to be an actor. He wanted to be a serious actor. And he took these acting lessons. And from what everybody has said, you know, that was one of his best performances ever was his first movie, Stay Hungry. You know, yeah, he gave yeah. a great performance of that. He was very he was very believable in uh, the dramatic scenes. Well, like I say, he won the Golden Globe for the best. Won the Golden Globe ever. Award, yeah. You know, so, uh, but I, you're, you're right. I, I, I should have mentioned that earlier. The Pumping Iron was a big calling card for Arnold. Yeah. Because even though it wasn't a like a, a scripted role, you know, in a way it was scripted, you know, but it, it yeah. wasn't it was not scripted. In other words, but it showed Arnold's ebullient personality. Yeah. Outgoing, and also his self-effacing humor that he can make fun of himself. Oh, know? yeah, he was you know? great. I mean, yeah. like, I, I always get a kick into that last scene when him and Louie are sitting, what was it, in a bus or a back? Yeah, yeah. And, and Arnold's going, <laughs> like, yeah. it's, you know, there's such big guys. They, they have to squeeze. I mean, Arnold And he was, told his dad, he goes, I'm going to get set up with your sister. <laughs> yeah. Or when, it, when Arnold's <laughs> eating breakfast with him and he's and his hand is shaking. Yeah, with yeah. The eggs, <laughs> you know, he's... And yeah. Then he says, you know, I called my mother in Austria and I told him, can you believe this? 
I, I win the Mr. Olympia again, and, and Louis Brothers, we'll see you, Arnold. Will you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that was funny. I mean, but it showed Arnold's personality, and it showed that, you know, from this perspective of movie people, it showed that this guy could be relaxed on camera, which is yeah. very important. Because, John, if you think about it, the so-called Golden Age bodybuilders, a lot of them had problems with that. Frank Zane was a very introverted, a great bodybuilder. There's no question yeah. about it. But he was very introverted. Frank Zane was not good on camera. You know, he, he, uh, even when he did his commercial, luckily he didn't talk much. He just, well, he was on a heart-to-heart. Heart-to-heart, heart heart. yeah, I saw that. Yeah, he was not good. <laughs> you know, you, you might say, if you watch that, I think it's on YouTube. He was, talk about stiff. Yeah. I mean, he was just horrible. I mean, yeah. really, I mean, not against Frank Percy, just acting is not his thing. He, he just yeah. was not comfortable. Another guy who was kind of photogenic, who the movie people really liked, was Dave Draper. Yeah. He did a couple of big Hollywood movies, Don't Make Ways, with Sharon yeah. Tate and Tony Curtis and Claudia yeah. Cardinal. I mean, that was a big studio movie, uh, uh, Lord Love a Duck with Ronnie McDowell. He made some. Uh, he was on Beverly Hill. Uh, Hill. He wasn't. He, he was pretty good. Yeah. He, I mean, he, he was a little stiff, but you know, he he had this kind of good look that they like the blonde thing. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. The, the problem with Dave was again introversion. He felt very very uncomfortable, and and, and it just wasn't for him. Yeah. He's a guy who just the opposite of Arnold. Whereas Arnold took up every. You know, when they said, "Well, we 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 we're thinking of putting you in this movie," Arnold said, "Okay, I'm ready." Yeah. They, they said no. I, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I just don't want to do it. And he and he basically voluntarily stepped out of the picture. Yeah. Hollywood wanted to keep using Dave Draper. He yeah. just couldn't do it. He was just so introverted. And Dave was a terrific guy when you spoke to him. Great yeah. guy, the nicest guy. He just some people just can't let themselves go. You know, the key, one of the keys to being a great actor is you have to be able to like get out of yourself in front of a camera. This is why Marlon Brando is such a great actor. He literally became the character where yeah. you, totally convinced, you were convinced that he was Don Corleone. Yeah. You, know, you completely forgot it was Marlon Brando from Nebraska. You know, he was became Don Corleone. That's that's what a, a, a true actor has to do. And my point about Arnold is in the latter movies of his career, and I, I would even give it to Conan. I would even include Conan. When you watch Conan, tell me if you disagree with this, John. I think Arnold was very convincing as Conan. Mm-hmm. In other words, I would believe this guy was this ancient, crazy, you know, warrior. Barbarian. I mean, it's totally believable in the role. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If you, you, to make it clearer, just picture Frank Zane playing that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> picture Danny Padilla. Right. Danny, Sergio Oliva. It just wouldn't have worked. Right, Arnold right. Was perfect for that role. Absolutely perfect. Yeah, so I think in the beginning, after he made Stay Hungry and he won that Golden Globe Award, I think his his idea was, I'm going to be a serious actor. And, exactly. and then what happened was, because uh, I remember when he made Stay Hungry, it was in Alabama, and that was in 1975 in, in April, I believe. And then the story I heard was George Butler came to Alabama, because Charles Gaines was out there every day filming, you know, because Charles Gaines co-wrote the script with, with Bob Richardson. So then Charles Gaines came out and he goes, he goes, hey, Arnold, we're going to make a movie about pumping out. We're going to make a documentary. We want you to be in it. And Arnold told him, no, I'm done. I'm done with bodybuilding. He said, I'm going to be an actor. I'm, I'm going to be a serious actor. And he's like, well, you got to go in the contest to be in the movie. So from what I heard, and I read this in Randy Roach's book, they negotiated to pay Arnold 50 grand to be in the movie. Okay. Which was a lot of money back in 1975. You do, you do about pumping iron movie. Yeah, talk about pumping iron. Yeah, right, right. What, so what, then he makes he makes pumping iron, and it's a critical hit. And Edward Pressman is a Hollywood producer, and he bought the rights for Conan the Barbarian because right. Conan was these pulp fiction novels uh, back in the 30s, I think. Robert E. Right. Howard wrote these things in the 30s, but then right. they caught on and they got popular again in the 70s because Marvel Comics released a, a comic book called Conan the Barbarian. Right. And then they they got this cult following again, you know, so then uh, they thought this would be a good movie. So Edward Crossman bought the rights to it. And then he goes, who are we going to get to play Conan? And then when they saw Pumping Iron, they Arnold, like you said, was so funny and he was charming and he was charismatic and he was had the body. And they go, that's our Conan. So they signed him to a five picture deal. 
But you know how Hollywood is with these big motion pictures. They had problems with the financing and the script. I guess Oliver Stone wrote the script to begin with, and it was like way too expensive. It would have cost them like a hundred million dollars to make it. You know, they said there's no way we can afford this. And you know, back then they didn't have all the special effects. They didn't have all the computers and stuff. So, and I heard Sean Connery and uh, Ra Raquel Welch were supposed to be in it at first. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. So, anyways, it ends up being delayed five years, and in between Pumping Iron and Conan. I think Arnold was trying to do movies and he was, and he was laughed at. I remember every, all the comics were laughing at him. They go, this guy's not going to be an actor. And right. then I think when he made Conan, he said, you know what? Fuck that. I'm not going to be a, a actor. I'm going to be a star. Right. You know, you can be a star or you can be an actor. And I think Arnold recognized, listen, I got the body. I got the, I'm, I'm bigger than life. Right. I could be a star. I'm not, I'm not going to be like a Dustin Hoffman or a Al Pacino, you know, I don't have the acting chops. I'm not that little guy. I might as well take advantage of my strengths. And I think then he kind of, he didn't really care if he was a good actor or not. He just wanted to make big movies, you know? Yeah. Well, you're uh, but concerning Conan, you're right about the Oliver Stone thing. And as I, as they pointed out in the documentary, they hired John Milius, Milius I believe. Yeah, name. he was a director, yeah. This, this guy was this really macho, crazy yeah. guy. Yeah, he, he liked to have the guys cut the other guy's head off. Right, I mean, right. I mean, you know, he, and he wanted got, you know, he didn't care if the actors like, you know, got injured, you know, yeah. had to do a lot of his own stunts in them because as you said, there wasn't CGI. You didn't have the computer stuff back then. Yeah, yeah. But it was a great combination because that's what that movie needed. It needed the yeah. real to do that. And that's yeah. one of the reasons why it turned out to be such a good movie. But I just want to say something about Pumping Iron. Uh, I think I mentioned to you this before. Of course, Arnold did not, not did not mention this in the documentary, but I was around at the time. There was a big controversy because, you know, that crew came into uh, Gold's Gym, the original Gold's Gym, to film the pumping iron. Of course, Arnold was already, it was going to be focused on Arnold and Lou, you know, uh, you know, training for that Olympia. As you said, they, they coaxed Ar Arnold to come back and compete in it. Yeah. Uh, Arnold told the rest of the guys at Gold's Gym, I wasn't there, this was relayed to me by some other guys, that, you know, it's a very low budget thing. This film has no budget. It has almost no money. Uh, I believe they held that show at the Whitney. Correct me if I'm wrong. Remember that show with Frank and Arnold? Yeah, Whitney Museum, Art yeah, Museum. One of the reasons they held that was to try and get money. Money, yeah. They, they were running out of money, yeah. They were running out of money. So Arnold said this, you know, to the other guys. He says, "Listen, guys, this we have this this uh, crew has no money, but I really think." that this film's going to help all of us. It's going to really, you know, highlight bodybuilding. It'll get rid of a lot of the misconceptions that we're all just freaks and lazy guys and stupid. It's yeah. going to help us all. So let's all voluntarily, let's forget the money and hopefully we can capitalize on this documentary if it's successful. And everybody said yes. Then it turns out for a couple of weeks, uh, it turns out that somehow it leaked out that Arnold was getting paid and no one else was. Right. And it was a lot of angry guys. Yeah. And Frank Zane jumped ship quickly. As soon as he saw where it was heading, meaning everything was going to be on Arnold, he said, this is just a film about Arnold. I'm out. And yeah. he actually changed his training headquarters from Gold's Gym, where he normally trained. He went to Vince's gym. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. in any of the scenes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, so, you know, a lot of guys were actually very, this wasn't said in the back. But a lot of those guys, some of the famous guys, you know, uh, of the era who trained to go, were very angry at Arnold for doing that. I don't know how they straightened it out. I never followed that through. <clears throat> but another thing I wanted to point out about Arnold was another reason why he was so successful as an actor was his versatility. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not only played Conan, which is almost like a Hercules role, he played like, like criminal guys. He played, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, twins, Comedy. yeah, yeah, that's another thing people were saying. And he, I think they talked about it in the documentary. How could this wait a minute? Wait a minute, even the guy who made it, what's his name? Uh, the director, I forgot his name, Ivan Reitman. Ivan Reitman, he was into he's saying, Well, you know, I had my doubts about Arnold, I know he's an action star, he's a great big guy, but I don't know, I could, couldn't see him doing comedy. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't convinced that he could do comedy. And, you know, Arnold gives it a shot and him with, with uh, what's his name? Danny uh, DeVito. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, again, they had some money problems where Arnold was already too big a star 
where they couldn't pay him his standard, what was it, 10, 15 million. And Danny DeVito was a pretty big actor. So they made an agreement that, all right, we're, we're not going to pay you. We're going to pay you what they call minimum wage for acting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, union wages, which is PL. Yeah. Scale. scale. Exactly, scale. But we're going to give you a larger percentage of the gross. Uh, yeah. The net, whatever it's called. And <laughs> the movie turned out to be a giant hit. Biggest and, hit. That was his and, biggest hit so far up to that point. And, and, and as Arnold alluded, I think it was Danny DeVito might have said in the in the documentary, I think it was Danny said this. He said those guys, Arnold and him, made more money on that single film yeah. than any other movie they made because it would turn out to be so sick. And, you know, they got that growth. So they made, mil there's a rumor that Arnold made like, like something like 60, 70 million. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Very well on that. Movie. I think it was Ivan Reitman, Danny and Arnold, all three of them agreed right. to the back end payment. That's, right. yeah. That's yeah. correct. That's correct. But I mean, my point is it showed Arnold's versatility, versatility because guys who knew Arnold, like me and all the other guys. Yeah. He they knew him when he was. Yeah. I knew he had a great set. He was a very right. fun Arnold right. was a hilarious guy. Where, you know, right. he was really funny. He used to make faces. Very funny. I knew he had a sense of comedy, but everyone else doubted because they looked at the cone, you know, this big, serious, yeah. serious guy, you know, he, he can't, you know, and th then he plays this role. Was, he was great. But did you and, notice, too, that all those action movies he made in the 80s, he was always throwing in one-liners, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like right. in Predator, he throws a knife at the guy and he goes sticking around, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was always yeah. throwing in a few one-liners. So well, that... They used to do that in the James Bond movies too. Sean yeah, Connery yeah, yeah. Shoots a guy in the movie Doctor No. Shoots a guy with a spear gun. Spear gun goes through the uh, the the guy and attaches him to a tree. And then Sean Connery says very calmly, "I think he got the point." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those are the kind of lines, Arnold. You know, right, right. I'll be back. He tells the and the doctor may tell a famous story. I was you know, how they changed the line. I said, you know, I will be back. Was yeah, the yeah. Line. And then Arnold, I think, was it Arnold who wanted to say, I'll be back? I think it was. I, uh, and he no, argued. I think Cameron wrote it, I'll be back. And then he goes, well, that doesn't make sense. He goes, I think if it was a machine. He would say, I will be back. Arnold said that? Yeah. And then Cameron said, did you write the movie? Are you a writer? I will yeah, that's be back. Right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I got it back. Was Arnold yeah. wanted to say, we'll be back. But that's, he didn't think there would be that, you know. Yeah, but like Arnold, you know. but it's like Arnold says in the documentary. That's now one of the most famous Hollywood lines. Yeah, in in history. Yeah, I mean, every time Arnold makes an appearance, he always ends his speeches. I'll be back. He's still oh yeah, saying, yeah. It's he's still time. saying it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so famous, you know. Yeah, but you want to talk about luck? I mean, if you look at how it all unfolded, I mean, now he was prepared. There's right. no doubt about it. And he was, he was, he was. I think Arnold was a star when he was a bodybuilder, and then just nobody knew about it. Right. But it was a, a series of events unfolding. Like Charles Gaines writes this book, Stay Hungry. And then they make the book Pumping Iron and they meet Arnold. And then they decide to make a movie of the book, Stay Hungry. And of course, Charles Gaines says, oh, you got to hire Arnold. So they hire Arnold. He gets in the movie, Stay Hungry. And then they decide to make the book or the movie Pumping Iron. And then Arnold's in the movie Pumping Iron. And that was his big, that was his introduction, I think, to the world more than Stay Hungry. Oh, absolutely. And, and then yeah. this guy, this producer happens to buy the rights to Conan right at that time. So then he's like, we need a Conan. And then he hires Arnold to be Conan. Right. And then and then the 80s comes along and Reagan gets nominated president. And then it's all about action heroes. And then he's just in that era at that time. Right. You know, right. it's like it was all a bunch of series of events unfolding. And yeah. he really got lucky. Yeah. But you know, one of the things that also I think about Arnold, you probably agree with me, Jerry. He's He's always learning all the time. He's always curious. And I think he said that. And, you know, he said, if you compare me to like one of my movie roles that I, I'm really most uh, alike, it would be Julius and twins. You yeah. know, he's he's always learning. He always wants to learn about this and learn about that. He's always curious. And I've heard like people who are on movie sets with him that, you know, he'll talk to the hairdresser and stuff and he'll be like asking them questions. Like when he's doing the makeup, he'll be like, well, how long do you have to put this makeup on? How'd you get into makeup? And he, he was, he's curious about everything and he wants to learn about different things. And that's why he was able to expand his life, you know, and then eventually he went away from movies. He got into politics. And I mean, he's just always, always expanding, always like his, you know, like that philosophy, stay hungry. That's what he is, you know? Yeah. I mean, that that's true. Arnold always uh, tried to, like I say, he would take, uh, uh, he set goals for himself and whatever it took to meet the goal, he would do. 
yeah. you know, acting lessons, speech lessons, whatever yeah. he needed to do. Yeah. And, you know, <clears throat> and he, I like the fact that, and other people have pointed out, this documentary showed a, 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 a type of Arnold that didn't exist when he was a bodybuilder. In other words, when Arnold was a top of the line bodybuilder in his heyday, you know, the king of bodybuilders, whatever you want to call him, he was a little bit egocentric and a little bit arrogant. It's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of that stuff where, where he psyched the people out, <clears throat> you know, that psychological technique like he did with Louis and some of the others in Sergio, yeah. walk yeah. off the stage, blah, blah. You know, some of that was... Yes, it was done for uh, uh, you know a, a psychological effect, <clears throat> but a lot of it was Arnold's arrogance. Yeah, he had a sense of arrogance. But the new Arnold, the mature Arnold, as shown in the video, is actually quite humble. Yeah, and that's something that kind of caught me off guard too. Yeah, I mean, I saw a a, 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 a type of Arnold that I didn't really know, yeah. <clears throat> even though I've known the guy for fifty years. I mean. Uh, and I've seen in my own dealings with Arnold years ago when I'd run into Arnold, he would be a little bit sarcastic, you know. Uh, I mean, he was always friendly, but like, like, you know, balls. <laughs> yeah, like, like, let's say, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you know, if I would run into, hey, Jerry, how you doing this and that, blah, blah. He says, he go like this. He says, you look like you need a little more ab work there. What's going on? <laughs> you know, he, he always put a little dig in there, you know? Yeah, yeah, always. But the, but the last time I saw him, the last couple of years, he's nothing but nice. Yeah. He asked me, how's my writing going, this and that, you know, yeah, my, my life, you know. Uh, when I saw him at the Franco Memorial, <clears throat> he introduced me to his girlfriend. And he said, uh, this is Jerry. He's uh, one of the smartest guys I've ever met, with a, a great writer. He says... Uh, you know, this guy knows everything about, I mean, he really built me up. And the girls, you know, the girlfriend's looking at me like, who is this guy? Yeah. Was really, I'm really laying it on. Yeah. And I was almost embarrassed because he was saying so many good. I mean, this was like not the Arnold of years ago. Yeah. With maturity and success, he's gotten nicer. Yeah. You know, some people, it gets the opposite. When they get successful, they get nasty. Arnold is the opposite. He's gotten do nicer. Think, do you think it's just because of... You know he's getting humbled by age, and and then he, he messed up. You know he did he at the end of the documentary he admits about messing up his family with that affair he had with the maid and having the baby out of wedlock, and then yeah. you know that that was probably his biggest failure of his life, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean he, uh, I think it has a lot to do with the age and the maturity. Yeah. And like you say, he looks at his body now and goes, "Oh, geez, I look like shit." <laughs> that really surprised me. My yeah. jaw dropped when he said that. I mean, yeah. he's walking around his very well-equipped home gym. In fact, when I knew about Arnold's gym, don't laugh, I was trying to get a hold of him. I needed a place to train. I was hoping that I could get a hold oh, of him. Oh, really? <laughs> I said, Arnold, can I train at the gym when you're there? Because I need a place. I never did get a hold of him, but that's okay because it worked out. But yeah. the is, I mean, he suddenly blurts out, I know I look like shit. You know, I'm thinking, whoa, yeah. Arnold. He would never say that years ago. Never. Well, we, our, all, all of us get old and our bodies fall apart. But, I mean, can you imagine being like Arnold, the best body in the, ever in the history, and then your yeah. body starts looking like shit? I mean, that's got to be hard to take, right? Yeah, I know. But, see, the thing is that that annoys me about a lot of the people who make comments about Arnold. I mean, a lot of oh, these yeah. people look at Arnold when he was, at, you know, Mr. Olympian, this, and somehow – they know he's older. I mean, Arnold's what seventy six now. I forget. He's seventy six this year, yeah. He's seventy six in July, I believe it is. Yeah. And you know, no matter who you are, if you're human, your body's going to change in your seventies, yeah. yeah. especially in your seventies. Yeah. I know. I'm in my seventies. I know. Trust me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, things get out of control even if you train and do everything right. Yeah. There's going to be a certain amount of muscle loss, and you know, and yet these morons. We'll look at Arnold at, in his mid-70s and expect him to look like at least 60% of the way he did as Mr. Olympia. Yeah. What nonsense. That's crap. You know, I mean, the fact that Arnold could make fun of himself like that, that shows that's the right attitude. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, he could get real depressed about it. And, you know, you see when he was looking through the scrapbook at all the pictures of himself. I mean, I mean, it, it, he has a good attitude about it is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. He's, he's accepting of the fact. And he also accepts, like you said, he made some serious mistakes in his personal life, which he fully accepts. You know, the thing about, you know, the maid. But on the other hand, 
in some ways, Arnold is just an amazing guy in that sense also, because, I mean, here's a guy who was married to this Maria Shriver, had four kids with her, you know, then, you know, has an affair with this woman and, you know, gets her pregnant, has the child. He keeps it secret for about, what, 10 years or something like that? And then finally yeah. admits it. And, you know, of course, that immediately leads to a estrangement between the two, followed a couple of years later by a full divorce. Yeah. And here they are. They're appearing in public together. They act like they're friends. Yeah. I mean, the kids still hang out. He's, he not only takes pictures with Joseph, but you see him with his other kids, too, his daughters, his son, who's trying to be an actor, too, his other son. I mean, it's only Arnold could do something like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, do do something that serious and yet still manage to more or less keep his family. Anyone else, it would have fell apart. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what goes through Maria Shriver's head. I guess she figures because maybe the kids love him so much that she's not going to be a bitch and, and you know, talk yeah. to I don't know what goes through her head. I don't know her. The only thing I know about Maria Shriver, <laughs> I think, I, is I know for sure she does not like bodybuilders. She yeah. doesn't. <laughs> You know, she does not like bodybuilders at all, but she put up with it because of Arnold. Yeah. She has no respect for bodybuilders. She thinks they're all idiots and muscle heads. Yeah, but, yeah. So, but, but, uh, you know, like I well, said, I've got a, I've got a couple of friends that have, uh, that I know who have cheated on their, cheated on their wives, got caught, and they got divorced. And I'll tell you, those wives have never forgiven them. <laughs> I mean, they're going to hold a grudge against that, against these guys for the rest of their lives. You know, they're never going to forgive them. Well, see, that's the that's the normal scenario. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. In yeah. most cases, if, I mean, not only did he cheat on her, but he had a child, and he kept it secret. That was and he thing. kept it secret. Yeah, I mean, that would most ninety nine point nine percent of women would say, you know, let me have half your money and get out of my life. Yeah. Don't pick up the phone. Don't ever call me. And yet somehow Arnold has manipulated the situation where, <laughs> like, they appear together in public. He still hangs out with his all his kids. Yeah. She, shows up on, on occasions like when the, one of those kids has a birthday they're both standing together i mean they're not have their arms around or anything like they always right. stand on the other side but yeah yeah the mere fact that she's still friendly to him is, yeah. is just amazing to me and, and something that only Arn, a guy like arnold could accomplish yeah Most people would never be able to do that that's another thing he that's amazing about you him. talked about how his uh personality changed how he used to be like a little arrogant and stuff when yeah. he was younger do, do you think uh because he was arrogant like that and he acted like the king, that that actually contributed more to his popularity when he was younger and he was a bodybuilder? Yeah, because it, it, it exuded self-confidence. Yeah, yeah. In other words, uh, in other words uh, okay, this guy here, this guy, uh, Serge Dubre, Serge Oliva, they, they could act like they're going to beat me, but you know what? They'll never beat me. Right, because right. They don't have it. I, you know, I mean, he was a little bit of a ball buster. He was arrogant. Yeah, yeah. He was yeah. cocky. Yeah. I mean, I think if I think if he would have been like uh, like Lee Haney, a good champion, you know, a nice guy. I mean, yeah. I don't think I mean Lee Haney made a few remarks about Lee Labrada or yeah. Gaspari and stuff, but he never, he wasn't like like Arnold, you know, he wasn't arrogant. Know, he was all. mostly a nicer guy, you know. Oh, Lee Haney was uh, probably because he's such a religious guy. Yeah, you know, he was always a gentleman, and uh, the worst, he never even directly attacked. I think in one video, well, I think it's in your opening. When he calls Mike Christian a chicken or something, yeah, like that. yeah it is. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't mention Mike Christian by name. He yeah. says, "I'm the uh, what do you say? I'm the uh, I'm the rooster, uh, the rooster, I'm the rooster, the and they're chickens." So. There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken. So to speak. <laughs> I mean, but he never mentions him by name. It's like an indirect right. remark, you know. Right. That's a, you know, that's a form of. And he only off. said that because Christian was giving him shit too. You know, so Christian was giving him some stuff. That's right. Yeah. But the point is, Arnold got you know he got a kick out of doing that. Yeah. That was part of Zara. I mean, he did that purposely to to not only get a psychological edge, as he says, but he personally had fun doing it. Yeah. He was a little bit sadistic in that sense. Yeah. He wanted to see these guys get uncomfortable. When but I, th I think you're right. I think it, it shows that he was confident. And like yeah. I remember when I was a teenage boy, you know, like 14, 15, 16, and I'd be reading about Arnold. It wasn't just me. It was me and all the other guys in the gym. Right. We loved Arnold We because sure. he was he was not only the best bodybuilder, but he was an example of what we wanted to be as a man, you know, right. looking at him. So if we're like insecure boys 
And we're looking at Arnold. Arnold's like confident. He goes in any situation. He takes it over. We also thought that he was a great uh, ladies man. You know, he, right, he right. could he could pick up any chicks. He would he this guy would never be intimidated about women. He'd go right. up to women. He'd say anything he wanted. He, he, he was did. Be late he all did. the time. You know, yeah. He did. I I witnessed him. I mean, I I told him the stories when Arnold. I mean, way when he way back when he first came over, Arnold had a really broken bad grasp of english she yeah. you know and i was at a party in malibu for chet yorn's house uh, you know the, one of the men who beat arnold yeah and there was you know beer flowing like you had big giant kegs of beer and arnold got drunk and i'm standing there and there was a lot you know it was a lot of girls there and arnold uh you know goes up to one of them right in front of me and he says uh <laughs> I, 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 this is a quote unquote it's not me talk he says to her uh, my name is Arnold. I would like to fuck you. You know, <laughs> yeah, right? And I cr I cringed when he said, "Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, gee, are we gonna have a, gonna have a situation here?" You know, she's an American girl. I figured she she's gonna slap. Arnold was a big, huge guy. And yeah. you know, I figured she's gonna slap him in the face anyway. Who knows what's gonna happen? Because Arnold was drunk. Yeah. You know, she thought about it for a second. She looked at him. He was so freaking big when he first came over. That she just gave him a dirty look and didn't say anything and walked away. Yeah. I took Arnold aside and I said, "Listen, Arnold, I don't know how it is in Europe, but here in the United States, you can't go up to women and say, I'm Arnold. I want to fuck you. You can't do that. <laughs> you cannot do that. It doesn't work." Right. He says, "He says, what do you mean? Look at her. She has no reason to do it. She was. He called her a dog's dinner. I still remember the, the expression he used. He said." <laughs> Who is she to reject me? She's a dog's dinner. That was his exact <laughs> words. I'll never forget it. He called her a dog's dinner. After right. all years, I can still remember that. I right. said, regardless, Arnold, regardless of what the girl looks like, it's a question of pride. In other words, when you say that, you're basically saying she's some sort of, you know, low class, you know, nothing person. Yeah. And and no woman will accept that, you know, none. Unless, even, unless maybe they're drunk or high on drugs. I well, see. even when he was in pumping air and he kissed that girl at the prison, remember? Yeah, yeah. And, and it, he goes, oh, she probably hasn't had a kiss for years, you know? <laughs> yeah. Says. Oh, yeah. But you remember that when he was running for governor, you know, they uh, was I can't remember when he was the re-election or the first. Uh, the or, first or, one. The first the one. The first one. You know, they were trying to, the LA Times, and I think they showed that in the movie. They did, they, yeah. That's that one of the better parts yeah. of the documentary. Yeah, they tried to build a case. They went after Arnold right before the election. And with the yeah. in the movie, one of the reporters gives the excuse that you know they, because they were accused of like a political assassination type of thing. Yeah, and, you know because it was like what five days before the election they he said uh, it took time to get the story together. Yeah, yeah they read articles about all these women that he supposedly groped when he was on the movie sets. Right. And, no, no, we we had to research it. You yeah. know, for weeks, which I think is bullshit. I don't buy that. Yeah. I don't buy that for a second. Listen, I've researched. You know, they could have done that a month. You know, the, the fact it was right before it was it would they were, you know, it was almost kind of like what, what uh, James Comey did with Hillary Clinton, when mm -hmm. which was almost guaranteed of beating Trump. And then it comes out about this thing. We're going to investigate emails and she loses. Yeah, you know, it's almost similar. I mean, they, you know, I don't know whether they were paid off to do that. I don't know what went on behind the scenes. But the point is that, you know, I think I told you the story. Some reporter from NBC News called me after the at times came out with that stuff. And he says, did you know, Ar I heard that you knew Arnold, uh, you know, back in the body. I said, I know him very well. They said, uh, you know, how many times did you see Arnold grow women? You know? So I, I said, I said, well, I said, I didn't want to tell him about, you know, the story I just told you, because I wasn't, I didn't want to add to the, you know, yeah, to the yeah, yeah. so what he says, well, let me put it this way. I've been with Arnold many times in public places like restaurants. And what I saw was women grope Arnold. Yeah. I was sitting at a table where a woman went over and put a hand right on Arnold's pectoral muscle and squeezed it. I said, now, if a guy did that to a woman, he'd be arrested on the mm -hmm. spot, right? And Arnold just laughed. It didn't bother him a bit. So the guy said, well, thank you very much, and hangs up. Yeah. He didn't like my story because he yeah, thought yeah, I, yeah. What, he yeah. wanted me to, to confirm that Arnold groped women. But Arnold talked bad to women. That was true. But I never personally witnessed Arnold groping women. It's the truth. Yeah. I never saw him grope a woman. But I've seen him say, like I say, uh, that's not the only time I saw him come on strong to women. But he didn't touch him. He didn't put a hand on him. Yeah. He would say gross things that, that you wouldn't normally say to a woman. 
you know. That, I want to talk about uh, part one of the documentary because that yeah. was a lot of him being a bodybuilder. But before we do, um, I was reading some of the reviews of the documentary, you know, like some of the movie critics or on Rotten right. Tomatoes or some of the other ones. And a lot of them uh, were a little bit tough on the documentary because they said it was narrated pretty much by Arnold. And they so, didn't have a lot of other uh, viewpoints. And they said it was kind of just a, a promotional piece for Arnold. Uh, uh, do, you, do you think they should have had um, more people like, you know, like Charles Gaines? And like, I mean, Boyer Co was in it for, like, I think, five seconds. Do you think they should have taken more of their input instead of just... I mean, Arnold's a great narrator of his own story. He's a great storyteller. Right, and he right. explains things very, very clearly. So, right. I mean, I thought that was a plus. But do you think the the documentary would have been more fair, or would have been better if they would have had other people given more uh, airtime? I, I I have to say yes, it would have been more balanced. Yeah, because more balanced. as it is, it's like you know. On the other hand, it was more like a tribute to Arnold. Yeah, you know? and I think also another reason I think they were they released it in close proximity to that Fubar movie. Right. Well, I, I, I heard that he's also. Uh... He has some kind of executive role at Netflix now, too. Well, I don't know if that was done for publicity or it's true. I, I'm not sure about that. But I know that I believe myself that this doc, the proximity of the release of this documentary to the FUBAR movie, which was released only right beforehand, the FUBAR movie's weak. Yeah. You know, so I think that they, they released this, this very complimentary video of Arnold to kind of like boost Arnold's popularity and maybe make people who that might not want to watch FUBU or watch it because of Arnold. I think that was possibly some of the thinking. Yeah. But to be honest with you, it would have been a more balanced documentary uh, if you if they had interviewed people that maybe were not as complimentary to Arnold. I mean, they don't have to get nasty, but, you know, maybe say, you know, it was just, a, there's a certain word, where, where it's almost like a tribute type of thing. Like when I'd write my articles, I would always make a point to give to all viewpoints. Yeah. I would talk about what some what, what people say about the good things about something. And then I would talk about the bad things. I wanted it balanced where you got both sides of the picture. Mm -hmm. And to really make a, a true, a really uh, good 100% uh, uh, documentary, they I agree, they should have interviewed Again, not necessarily enemies of Arnold, but people that might have, uh, like for example, they 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 might have had somebody say something to the effect of, "Well, you know, Arnold's a very successful guy. Uh, I credit him, you know, for for, for uh, you know his his drive and his goals and all that. But you know, he also really stepped on a lot of other people and you know didn't care and didn't help out the people he could have helped. You know, that would have uh, maybe put a little negative slant on it." But it would have been created a balance against all the positive things that were in. But I think the way this documentary was produced, it was only to show how a nice a guy Arnold. They didn't want any negativity at all. Yeah, I thought the only uh, balanced part where they did talk about the truth was that what we just talked about, that third part where they were talking about the politics and they were talking about the groping of the women and all that stuff. Yeah. That yeah. was the only part I thought when they were interviewing all those reporters. Yeah. That was the only part that resembled like a real documentary, you know, where exactly. they're building into the truth and finding out different things. Well, yeah. I credit them for doing that. Yeah, yeah, I me mean, too. I mean, that was the one part that was kind of in, that, the, the, that was in opposition to all the other, you know, lovely things that everyone was saying about Arnold. <laughs> right, right. right. Words, like if they would have put that in, it would have been, you know, almost silly. If they had to put that in, you know. Yeah. I mean, and they did it in a good way. Yeah. I mean. You know, the reporters explain, yeah, we were accused of putting it at the last minute and this and that to try and, uh, you know, mess up Arnold's chances, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, they had to put it in. Yeah. Uh, and then they showed Arnold. Didn't they show Arnold basically apologizing? Uh, you yeah, know, he said where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, again, is a credit to Arnold. I mean, uh, yeah. unlike certain politicians whose name I won't mention, <laughs> Arnold admitted his mistakes. Yeah. Oh, and he, and uh, you know he came out and apologized. Yeah, which is much better than denying it when the truth is so obvious. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. So, you know, I got to give him credit for that. You know, but I mean, I was very touched when I saw it when he when he start when he's talking about Franco because yeah. and that that scene almost put tears in my eyes. Yeah, when he's riding the bike and they come up to the mural of yeah. Franco when he touches. Uh, I mean, you could see how. I mean, he was almost in tears himself. 
talking about how much he misses uh, Franco. Yeah. I mean, he says, he says, no man ever had a better, he says, I wish everybody could have a friend like Franco. And that was from the heart. That was Arnold. Yeah. That was 100% truth, you know, because they were, they were closer than brothers, those two. Yeah. They were, yeah. That was not made up. Yeah. That was a fact. Yeah, it was a fact, you know. Yeah, they were friends since 1965, and Frankel was a really, I mean, I'm sure Arnold was a good friend of Frankel, but Frankel was very loyal to Arnold. I mean, Very he, loyal to Arnold. Oh, my God, he was on a pedestal to Franco, you know. Hey, John, I think I told you the story about the 72, uh, was it an S in Olympia? Yeah, yeah. You know, when I, when I spoke to uh, several of the competitors after the contest who compete against Arnold, Frank Zane, all these other people, and everyone said that Arnold shouldn't have won Except one person, Frank. <laughs> Franco. I said, I asked Franco, I would want a clear winner. <laughs> one day, and Sergio de Lima doesn't have the shape that I'm You know, <laughs> and I, I, had, I hadn't seen the photos yet. Yeah, so yeah. You know, I, I gave Franco the benefit of the doubt. But afterwards, I realized, of course, Franco's going to say that. Yeah. Arnold's like his big brother for Franco. Well, he said that in 1982 when Arnold won. He said in 1980. And just like, Arnold would probably, I don't know if Arnold publicly did, maybe you know, Arnold would probably say that Franco deserved to win the 81 Olympia. No, I think he said, uh, I think he said he would have gave it to Tom Platts. He did? Arnold said <laughs> yeah. that? Yeah. Well, that surprises me. I think Arnold was very, very worried about Arnold, about Franco going in it because he knew after 1980 that if Franco went in it and Franco won, he was going to yeah. get all the heat, you know, so yeah. he didn't, he didn't want Franco to do it, but he did it anyways. Oh, okay. I see. I'm surprised. I, I would think that Arnold would just instead if he could say that Arnold, I mean uh, Franco deserved that he would just be silent or or, or give a. Well, I've speech. read some interviews where Arnold was, you know, kind of critical of Franco, you know. So, really? Yeah. He's critical, Franco. Like right after, um, right after he won the '75 Olympia, he did an interview with Rick Wayne, and uh, Rick Wayne was interviewing all, a lot of the guys that were in uh, yeah. South Africa. So he interviewed Robbie. He interviewed Ken Waller. He interviewed Franco, and Franco was saying how close it was between him and Arnold for the overall, you know, in 75. Yeah. And he's like, you know, they always go with Arnold because, you know, he was the winner. But it was really, really close, and I really pushed him hard. Yeah. And so then uh, Rick Wayne interviewed Arnold next, yeah. and he told he told Arnold what Rick what uh, Franco said. And he starts laughing. He goes, oh, that's Franco. He goes, here's the truth. He goes, there's Arnold on one level, and he goes, on the next level, there's nobody because nobody's even close to me. And then on the next level, there's Franco and Robbie and all those other guys. <laughs> right. Well, basically true at the time. It's true. Yeah.